of discussion today is India's prospects in the maritime sector, the steps the government has taken in this regard and the road ahead. A major part of the thrust the government is putting into this sector is the second Maritime India Summit inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi a short while ago. The summit will host forums to foster interaction between stakeholders through B2B and G2B meetings. Special sessions on investment opportunities in India's maritime sector, including shipbuilding, ship repair, ship recycling, dredger or barge manufacturing. The first Maritime India Summit 2016 was held during 14 to 16th April 2016 in Mumbai. MIS, that's the Maritime India Summit 1, was the made in such effort by the Ministry of Shipping, Government of India, to showcase investment opportunities offered by India's maritime sector. What have been the results of all these efforts that have been put in over the years? We discuss this and more with our guests on the show. I'd like to welcome Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, DG National Maritime Foundation, who's, uh, who, to whom we've been able to connect right now. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, first of all, your reactions, your thoughts on the holding of the second Maritime India Summit. I think that the uh, holding of the uh, second Maritime India Summit couldn't have been more timely. India is launching itself as a major stabilizing beneficial maritime power. And uh, it is high time that we began to look more and more closely at the maritime domain. I'm fond of saying this, I said it earlier and I will at the cost of some repetition. That India in the next 100 years will either succeed or fail as a nation and the differentiator between success and failure will be a function of how cleverly, how adeptly, how adroitly uh, we are able to dive to make. So the Maritime India Summit is absolutely timely and it is a marvelous uh, uh, example to show that India is indeed conscious of these factors and is taking concrete steps towards this entire domain and establishing itself as a mutually beneficial part. Thank you. The, the purpose of uh, the Maritime India, India Summit is uh, to boost investment in the shipping sector. Uh, uh, how do you look at it uh, from that point of view, considering that it's being held in a hybrid format? Uh, there will be in-person experience, uh, but experiences, but it will be mostly virtual. How much promise uh, does the Indian shipping industry have for the rest of the world? Which are the countries that could most benefit from investing here? Well, to start with, you know, the, uh, the preservation, the promotion, the pursuit of uh, our, our, uh, our maritime trade is a major, if not principal, maritime interest of the country. And I think that there are some six or so, so uh, factors under which this maritime summit and the Maritime India Vision views this, uh, the merchandise trade being exported and imported, the percentage of goods being carried on our Indian bottoms, the age, the size, the technolo technological advancement of our uh, of our uh, merchant fleet, both uh, foreign going as well as uh, domestic. Uh, the directional pattern, where is our trade going and coming from, the density and the technological advancement of our ports and our nation's shipbuilding capacity and capability. All of these sectors require regional, extra regional, investments and partnerships more than investments so that India can acquire these technologies, acquire these skill sets and actually move towards being Atmanirbhar or self-reliant. Whom does this really most benefit? I think it benefits most of all the countries of the region because uh, all of the countries of the region look to India and that isn't only the littoral countries or the countries with coastlines, but countries like Nepal, like Bhutan, like Afghanistan, like the Central Asian Republics, all of whom look to India uh, as a champion in terms of its technology, in terms of its economy, in terms of its political leadership, in terms of its uh, ability to think and to ex articulate its thoughts coherently. And therefore, the 
the, if you look at this uh, uh, Maritime India Summit, the Maritime India Vision 2030, the, the whole concept articulated by the Prime Minister of the Indo-Pacific uh, Oceans Initiative, and also, uh, of course, the overarching rubric of uh, Sagar, I think that all these are now beginning to mesh together into a genuinely impressed and uh, promise film. Uh, set of initiatives and I think that uh, we, as we move forward, Maldives, um, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, all the countries of BIMSTEC and all the countries of the Indian Ocean region in the island developing states, the East African uh, sub-regions and the East African shoreline uh, with South Africa, with Kenya, with Mozambique, with Madagascar, with Seychelles, with Comoros, all of these, all of these stand to benefit greatly. So India, and, the, and there's a reason for this. You see, India's central belief is that all boats rise with a rising tide and India cannot be sitting in the Indian economy, cannot be sitting on some crest while the regional economies are wallowing in some trough. So if India's economy has to rise, if India has to be a maritime economy, all other economies must rise along with it. And that is the crucial... Uh, <laughs> sir, sir, the theme of uh, this year's Maritime Summit, Maritime India Summit, is exploring potential business opportunities uh, in the Indian maritime sector and making Atmanirbhar Bharat. The focus now is on a self-reliant India. An India that uh, will use goods, it will use services made in India. The vision that the Prime Minister showed us today, the, vis the vision that the Prime Minister spoke of today, uh, how possible is it, how ready is India to really achieve that vision in terms of manpower resources? Because when we talk about port cities, where most of the activities, uh, I, uh, as I imagine, will take place, uh, they are some of the most expensive uh, places to say. Do we have the infrastructure to enable living conditions uh, in order to ensure that there is a good workforce there in order to ensure that this vision is attained? Sir, if you can hear me. Yes, Vice sir. Admiral Chauhan. Oh, okay. Yes. So, thank you. Yes, of course, I can hear you. Uh, I, uh, I do want to uh, respond. Do we have the infrastructure? Uh, yes, we have a takeoff level of infrastructure. No, we don't yet have an infrastructure that will enable us immediately to uh, establish ourselves and catapult our maritime sector from uh, where it currently stands, which is at the cusp of great promise, to a position where it actually enjoys the command. What do we need to get there and how soon do we need to do it? I think that what we need to get there is this whole business of constructive engagement with countries that are capable of providing us with infrastructure, with technology, with skill development. We are not in Industry 3.0 anymore. We're not in Maritime Industry 3.0. We're not in Port 3.0. Already there are ports around the world in our region itself that are leveraging the skill sets and the uh, capabilities that are generated from Industry 4.0. Are we ready? Uh, I think that we're getting there. Yes. But therefore, we need partnerships. And those yes. partnerships are what we're seeking to uh, promote. Yes, uh, uh, understood, sir. Well, coming to uh, our other guest who's just joined us, Amitabh Kumar, who is the DG of uh, Shipping, a very and also Rajesh Gopalakrishnan, who is a GM Strategy and New Projects Cochin Shipyard Limited. Both of them, uh, well, we've been able to connect to both of them on the show. A very warm welcome to you, sirs. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, coming to you, Mr. Kumar, how your reactions, your thoughts on the inauguration of the second Maritime India Summit? Uh, it's uh, the second such a summit many countries expected to attend. Denmark is the partner country. It's been around four years uh, since the last summit was held in 2016. Uh, five years, uh, can, can we say. Uh, uh, 
how do you look at the road traveled so far? It was a grand uh, opening. Uh, the Prime Minister was at his eloquent best. Uh, the summit uh, is, uh, is an amalgamation of uh, a lot of hard work that has been done by the Ministry in, uh, in the past few years. Uh, the Maritime India Vision 2030 that has been launched uh, by the Honorable Prime Minister today uh, is uh, uh, is a is a document which will really take us to uh, the the next generation of maritime industry in India, uh, be it uh, in port development, be it in shipping, be it in training, be it in uh, shipbuilding, ship recycling. Uh, they knowledge uh, management, knowledge cluster, skill development. Uh, name uh, the sector and the vision has uh, thought of uh, uh, the strategies that India need to adopt uh, in terms of uh, catapulting itself uh, to the leading position in maritime sector in the world. Uh, this is a, a, a great occasion. Uh, this is a launch of uh, what uh, we can say uh, the future of maritime in India. Uh, of course, uh, the onus is now on all of us to ensure that the vision that has now been released is implemented and is uh, uh, is used uh, to to increase maritime activities in India uh, in a very uh, environment friendly manner. Uh, the way uh, the world is now moving towards uh, uh, digitization, automation, uh, environment protection in maritime sector. It is time for us to not not only catch up with uh, with the world, uh, but to contribute uh, in all these segments uh, in the maritime field. Right, sir. And when we talk about Denmark as a, a partner country, uh, how how do you look at Denmark's role? during the course of this summit and during the course of these past few years? Denmark along with uh, Sweden and Norway uh, are now the biggest innovators uh, in maritime technology and are uh, one of the biggest proponents of green shipping, green ports. Uh, a lot of work is being done uh, in these countries. The uh, in the last summit, Norway was our partner country, and in this summit, Denmark is uh, the partner country. Uh, it shows uh, the commitment that these countries have on uh, promoting green shipping. It also shows the commitment that India has in adopting green technology when we think and talk of developing our blue economy. So it is a very good uh, relationship that the two of us have. Uh, other than uh, the, uh, the uh, business uh, uh, submits that would be happening uh, in the sideline of this maritime submit, it is also the thought, the knowledge transfer, uh, the exchange of ideas between the two countries uh, that would enrich this submit and would uh, help all of us in the sector to understand the future developments better. Right, uh, Amitabh Kumar, sir, and uh, also well, Vice Admiral Chauhan, stay with us. We'll be coming back to you. Meanwhile, reminding ourselves of what leads us to discuss all these issues about the various prospects that we have, the roadmap uh, that has been drawn, that will be drawn by the Maritime India Summit, which begins today after being inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi a short while back. We look at all the various issues related to the maritime sector. Here's a look now at what the Maritime India Summit is all about very briefly. The Maritime India Summit 2021 is a three-day virtual summit being held from the 2nd to the 4th of March and organized by the Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways.
It aims at visualizing a roadmap for India's maritime sector for the next decade with the aim of working to propel India to the forefront of the global maritime sector. Eminent speakers from several countries are expected to attend the summit in which they will explore potential business opportunities. The aim is to boost investments in India's maritime domain. The partner country for the three-day summit is Denmark and the theme is exploring the potential business opportunities in the Indian maritime sector and making Atmanirbhar Bharat. Bureau report, DD India. And uh, we also have with us uh, our other guest, uh, Rajesh Gopalakrishnan, uh, GM Strategy and New Projects, Cochin Shipyard Limited. A warm welcome to you also, sir. First of all, your thoughts on this uh, wonderful occasion. We are being shown a vision of a wonderful India, a developed India, compared to countries like uh, Sweden and Denmark, which is one of the partner countries. What are your thoughts on this occasion as the Prime Minister a short while back uh, inaugurated the Maritime India Summit? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, just like uh, Mr. Amitabh Kumar put it across, uh, a lot of effort has gone into uh, the fructification of what we saw today uh, through the inauguration of the Maritime India Summit 2021. Uh, we have also brought out the Maritime India Vision 2030, into which also significant efforts have gone. And what has been laid out in the Maritime India Vision 2030 is a vision which is challenging, nevertheless. However, it is we have made sure that whatever has come into the report are achievable. And once we get there, we would be amongst the top maritime nations in the world. The Maritime India Vision covers a lot of areas. It includes shipping. It includes the entire spectrum of the maritime space, right from the shipping industry through shipbuilding, ship repair, ship recycling. It passes on to skill development and the whole plethora of uh, what is covered under the maritime in, uh, industry. So having said that, the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, today when he re released the uh, Maritime India Vision has also stated very clearly that India with a vast maritime sector with a coastline of more than 7,500 kilometers has significant potential in this area. We are also looking very, very deeply and strongly in, into the inland water space and a lot of effort and uh, is going on into development of infrastructure in the inland water space as well. So the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister today mentioned that we would be targeting to make 23 waterways fully operational by 2030. As we speak, national waterways number one, two and three are already uh, moving and uh, Things have started happening there. What we are also looking at is, while we say that we would reach a certain level by 2030, we would actually want to do it by ensuring that we do it at the global standards, at the best of global standards as well. So today, from where we stand, what we see or what we envision in 2030 is something of a, a new emerging waterway scenario in India, which will not only provide significant transportation, it will provide significant uh, cargo movement, it will also provide for tourism by way of cruise. Right. Uh, right. So this is uh, where we would be looking at and I'm sure there are actionable points that have been laid into the vision, so this will all actually happen. Right. Well, it's, it's a vision that is mind-boggling in many ways. As uh, you have just mentioned, uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, it is, there are a lot of challenges. We'll talk about them, but uh, uh, let's go across now to uh, Amitabh Kumar, sir, uh, Director General of Shipping. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, here's a look, a reminder of what the budget allocations were that uh, the Finance Minister announced uh, as far as ports were concerned. 
Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman laid out an elaborate plan for the Indian maritime sector, especially ports, in the budget 2021. The highlights were that seven major ports worth 2,000 crore rupees would be privatizing operations in 2021-22. Subsidy scheme of 1,624 crore rupees for five years for Indian shipping companies. The aim is to encourage more merchant ships with Indian flag, she said, and said that the initiative will enable greater training and employment opportunities for Indian seafarers boosting recycling of ships at Alang in Gujarat. She also said that the capacity of recycling shipyards would be doubled by 2024. India has enacted Recycling of Ships Act 2019 and acceded to the Hong Kong International Convention in this regard. Sitharaman said, post-enactment of the law, nearly 90 ship recycling yards at Alang in Gujarat have already achieved HKC compliance certificates. Ports Shipping and Waterways Minister Mansukh Mandavia recently said that India aspires to grab at least 50% of global ship recycling business. The country's share in the ship recycling business is around 30%. At present, going back uh, to Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, uh, pr uh, Vice Admiral Sir, when we talk about recycling of ships, which are the countries that we should look at in order to talk about best practices? How far are we on the road towards uh, incorporating those best practices and arriving at uh, you know at, and and being on the global stage with the best in the world? Vice Admiral, sir. Vice Admiral mm -hmm. Chauhan. Sir. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we seem to be having a problem with that. Let's go across to DG Shipping, Amitabh Kumar. Uh, Amitabh ji, uh, yes, when. Can you hear? Well, there's a slight audio problem there with uh, Vice Admiral Chauhan. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Amitabh, if you can hear me. Yes, yes, I can. Right. When we talk about the potential uh, as far as doubling recycling capacity is concerned that was allocated in the budget, what are we basically talking about and how far as a nation, how far as a shipbuilding nation, as a ship recycling nation, are we on the road towards being at par with the best? Uh, see, in ship recycling, India is the global leader. Uh, it uh, recycles around 30% of uh, uh, the total ships recycled around the world. Uh, till uh, up till now, uh, our ships were being recycled on the basis of the rules uh, that were developed uh, locally by the government of Gujarat uh, under the directions of the Honorable Supreme Court. Last year, India decided to. Uh, to accept uh, the Hong Kong Convention, and now the Hong Kong Convention has been legislated. Hong Kong Convention is a convention made by the International Maritime Organization for safe and environmental, environment friendly recycling of vessels. Uh, and by adopting uh, this convention, India has given a very clear signal that it is in a position to adopt the global best practices in so far as recycling of ship is concerned. Uh, all, almost all our yards at Alang are now capable of recycling vessels as per the provisions of Hong Kong Convention. Almost two thirds of the yards have already been certified by international recognized organizations as uh, uh, as capable of uh, uh, recycling vessels in accordance with Hong Kong Convention. So once uh, uh, the world uh, has witnessed that Indian recycling facility is uh, as per the global standards set by the International <coughs> Maritime Organization, we expect that many countries' uh, flag vessels that were not coming to re uh, ship recycling yards uh, for ship recycling because of their 
domestic policies would start coming to Alang for uh, recycling. And uh, uh, a lot of discussions are going on all, uh, 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 simultaneously to ensure that these flag vessels start coming to Alang uh, and they get recycled as per the provisions of Hong Kong Convention. You also heard the Honorable Chief Minister of Gujarat today uh, who mentioned that uh, they are already working on increasing the capacity of the shipyards at Alang so that uh, uh, the, the total capacity increases uh, from the present 30% uh, of the world uh, uh, recycling to 50% of world recycling. Uh, with these legislative changes uh, and uh, increase in uh, capability of the shipyards of Alang, uh, we are very certain that we will uh, further consolidate our position as number one ship recycler in the world uh, to, to become almost uh, uh, the most predominant recycler uh, in the world. Well, that explains what the finance minister said when she spoke about uh, doubling recycling capacity, increasing it by manifold. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Kumar, uh, 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 very briefly before you go, because we believe that uh, you uh, you do have to leave, uh, you, you spoke about a total of 300 MOUs involving an investment of 10,000 crore rupees and job opportunities for about 55,000 aspirants envisaged to be approved in the summit. How positive are you that this will happen? Uh, see, uh, I was very clear with the industry that we need to sign only those MOUs which are easily implementable. Uh, none of the MOUs that we have signed in DG shipping are uh, going to stretch the industry. Uh, and uh, I am very positive that in next next two years, we will see 90% of the MOUs implemented. So uh, all the, of the 20,000 crores worth of MOU that has been signed by my office, uh, mm -hmm. I am very certain that 80 to 85 percent will be implemented in next two years itself. Uh, as far as job creation is concerned, uh, these MOUs have been signed uh, by recognized uh, 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 organizations these, these are called RPS. Uh, they have already uh, started contracting uh, management contract for uh, these vessels. And uh, uh, the, the jobs will come in phases over a period of five years. So when we talk of uh, creation of almost 50,000 jobs, we will see uh, about eight to 9,000 jobs created in the first year itself and it will gradually increase to 50,000 over a period of five years. But this, I, I am sure, is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I am not bothered, worried uh, whether we will achieve this target or not. Uh, I am very certain that we will far, far exceed this target of 50,000 jobs uh, and uh, would place ourselves as at least the second biggest job uh, provider. Uh, for merchant shipping in the world. Right, sir. Amitabh, sir, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and uh, we wish you all the best uh, and very heartening information there that uh, the job generation, the generation of uh, employment uh, through this summit, uh, through the various MOUs that could be approved, could actually exceed more than 55,000 as envisaged earlier. Coming to you, uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, with the same question that I was talking about, uh, that, that I had wanted to ask you before, uh, the Maritime India Vision 2030 envisages uh, developing world-class ports infrastructure. Where are we so far on that front? What is it that we need right now when we talk about world-class ports infrastructure? So world-class port infrastructure is an aspirational point that India simply has to be moving sharply towards. What we really need for this is for the government to be presented with a what, we, what I call an efficient. Now an efficiency matrix is when you decide, before you decide where to build a port, 
uh, you should the government should be in a position to tick mark a series of uh, weighted uh, issues that will determine whether or not you should build a port and announce a port building in a given place or not so let me try and explain this really quickly any government can direct its country or its organizations to make a port in a given place but no government can direct trade to come to that port for trade to come to a given port the port must have the ability to generate money profit profit is generated where there are efficiencies and for that therefore an efficiency matrix is critical and yet at the moment i think that under this particular vision to 2030 there should be room i can give you uh, at the cost of sounding like this is a plug but the national maritime foundation uh, is indeed working on precisely such a efficiency matrix and we are already in discussion with some levels of the ministry of ports uh, waterways and shipping uh, towards this particular approach one more thing i want to emphasize the largest risk that we currently face in implementation of all of three out of the six projects within the india vision uh, 2030 that is the port regulation the uh, riverine uh, uh, connectivity grid and the promotion of water transport all three face the largest risk that we do face is really the lack of resilience to the deleterious effects of climate change sea level rise storm surges uh, coastal erosion all these aspects and and india is a lead country it is in fact the prime minister's major vision that launched the coalition international coalition for uh, disaster resilient infrastructure or cdri and yet neither the sagar malas four pillars took the fifth pillar to be resilience of the ports uh, it is my hope i haven't gone through all the details of the maritime india vision 2030 but what i have gone through is it still lacks this one element which i think is crucial the largest risk in the future can cannot simply be wished away so where are we in port efficiencies and in port global positioning i think that regionally we are very good we need to get some rationalization on two fronts going earlier we had some clash between sagar pulling in one direction sagar mala pulling in the other i am very pleased to see that this has been resolved and that maritime india vision 2030 envisages not just india developing at the cost of its neighbors but its neighbors being part of the development to story at a regional level what the what the prime minister refers to as sabka saath sabka vikas neighbors first that is what he has always said Uh, well, coming to you, Mr. Gopal Krishnan, uh, uh, referring to what Vice Admiral Chauhan has said about how uh, India is one of the best among her neighbours as far as shipbuilding is concerned, as far as uh, port development is concerned. Uh, the aim is now to be worldwide, globally, the best. In this context, how do you look at the Chabahar port and what India has achieved there? What is the message that has gone out? as a result of what india has achieved in with chabahar yeah uh, just to, to reflect on that point regarding india uh, needs to be amongst the globally leading countries or globally best countries uh, if we were to look back say about 10 to 15 years uh, when shipbuilding and the entire industry was doing well uh, india was actually doing well too we had lots of uh, shipyards in india delivering best in class vessels into uh, into uh, many countries in the world uh, uh, indian ship ships have been delivered into europe the us and uh, we were doing well and it was at that time as you all know the recession struck and lehman brothers happened in 2008 after which the entire industry has also gone down Uh, but having said that uh, even today india is capable of delivering uh, top quality vessels but if you were to ask me are we on a scale and magnitude that matches the best in the world no so that is where we need to catch up but when it comes to niche vessels technologically sound vessels yes india can do it uh, as regards your question on chabahar i am aware of the fact that uh, 
Indian intervention and the Indian contribution has been uh, significant and we can see renewed focus. We can see a lot of infrastructure that is going into the, uh, Chabahar from India and it is a key, key location as far as our country is concerned. And I think uh, uh, the ministry has also a significant focus towards Chabahar. As you are all aware, the third day of the Maritime India Summit has also been named Chabahar Day. So you know the significance and the importance that we attribute to this particular venture. And it will go a long way in, in actually positioning India as a, as a neighbor friendly, as a, as, a, as, a, as a leader in this part of the world as we move towards becoming one of the leading uh, uh, countries in the world, as we all know. We are all predicting India to be up there by, say, around 2040 on the economic uh, front. Uh, but I think uh, even otherwise, right now as we speak, the smaller uh, neighboring countries are all uh, benefiting. The waterway development in India is actually benefiting trade into areas like Bangladesh, Nepal. So I think um, well, we, are, we are on track and uh, we are really on track and uh, the recent uh, increase and the fast pace at which things are happening, uh, I think, you know, a lot of things in Vision 2030 could actually be achieved even prior to that. Right. Mr. Gupalakrishnan, when we talk about, uh, uh, say, doubling our recycling capacity, for example, when we talk about increasing ports, when we talk about improving port infrastructure, what would you say are the challenges right now? Uh, also, uh, well, one factor you've mentioned is the fact that there was a recession that has been going on for nearly a decade now in the shipping industry. Is it still continuing? What is it that could bring about a change now that uh, in, in the sense that the Prime Minister is talking about? Uh, yeah, the, the recession actually, the, if you well, to look at the shipping industry by itself, uh, uh, the shipping industry has really not thoroughly come out of the recession. It's, it's, it's coming back, it's growing, there is develop, there is growth and there is uh, positivity all around. But uh, we've not reached back to the levels, you know, where we were prior to that. Uh, so that is uh, on the shipping side. Coming to your question on the challenges that, uh, you know, a, a recycling industry would face uh, to grow you know, two times uh, by 2050, as the vision states. Uh, yes, uh, we uh, like uh, uh, Chauhan also mentioned. We have India has adapted uh, the Hong Kong Convention. Almost all our yards are compliant, HKC compliant, which means you know, globally, uh, uh, countries who are worried about environment would now find it. Uh, the best place to come and uh, uh, break their ships or for their ships or breaking. Uh, having said that, uh, there is still a, a, a small barrier called the EU uh, compliance, which I believe is uh, uh, slightly more cha challenging than the HKC compliance on which uh, our industry, the ship breaking industry is already working on. And once you're HKC compliant, I understand that we are more or less there uh, but I think we still have a, 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 a little more to go there. Uh, as regards the ports, yes, uh, infrastructure development is a key uh, factor. Efficiency improvement is another factor. And uh, there are also technological aspects that come into play today. Uh, vessels are now becoming um, uh, you know, more and, uh, operating more and more on alternate fuels, uh, electric uh, charging facilities are becoming the norm slowly. So infrastructure development on the technology front is also something that uh, um, we need to work on. But I'm, I'm aware that uh, all our ports are already looking at this. People are already working on it. So so that is why I mentioned that we are on track because, because today we have a leadership, we have a, a, a community which is actually wanting to uh, look at the best in the world and move in that direction rather than wait and allow it to come to us. Yes, yes. Uh, Vice Admiral Chauhan, uh, when the Finance Minister spoke about uh, seven major ports worth 2,000 crore rupees uh, to be privatizing operations in 2021 to 2022, she is uh, clearly talking about a very important aspect, that of private 
inclusion into this massive industry with which has so much potential but which has for a long time been a public sector and an enterprise what do you think of that in the context of the present day scenario where uh, th there's so much need for employment there's so much need for jobs there's so much need for investment i think that uh, i once again i'm forced to uh, simply Lord, the prime, the the ministerial effort and the and the minister's uh, view, the finance minister's view. Uh, I entirely support this. We have languished. I know that we have some really uh, important uh, shipyards uh, and their representation here on this panel as well. But I want to emphasize that we used to have something like twenty three private shipyards, and now which were all functioning and uh, doing well at some stage or the other. And within a period of perhaps a decade and a half, we now have one. Yes. We just have one. I think it's Larson and Tubro, which has its only functional, meaningful shipyard, which is capable of actually producing ships. So moving the industry away from the um, grip of purely or the, the, the uh, obsession with the public sector undertakings is something that a wise government does. A, will that create more jobs or less jobs? I think that if we look at, as I mentioned earlier, the requirement to right skill the people, then you will end up with more jobs, better paying ones and more secondary tertiary ones. If we decide that we're going to stay with the skilling India uh, in industry 3.0, then I'm afraid we're going to be down a vicious cycle of job depletion. So since job creation is so crucial, as you quite correctly put it, I think that the only real solution is to have a massive dose of privatization within the maritime industry as a whole, but within ports and ship construction in particular, even where India's global niche exists to its great advantage in terms of warship construction, even there, it is, it is the private industry's participation, perhaps not in competition with public sector, perhaps in collaboration with it, that will launch India and it will tap into this one great advantage that India has over the rest of the world. And that is India's ability to innovate this innovation requires an environment which is best nurtured by the private sector and not by the public sector. Mr. Gopalakrishnan, would you agree that the private sector should be as much a part of the shipping industry as, uh, as uh, the government? Uh, I fully agree. Uh, I, I am coming. I come from a public sector environment, but uh, I fully agree with Admiral that this has to go hand in hand. Uh, there is actually it's not a it's not that you compete with each other. You actually collaborate with each other and you grow together. And that's a model that has worked uh, wonderfully well uh, in the Navy uh, sec naval segment. And uh, uh, we we feel you know there is a huge possibility uh, of uh, doing that in all other areas as well. Having said that, um, individually shipyards individually are capable of uh, delivering, like uh, he mentioned, uh, LNT shipyard, they are uh, capable of delivering by themselves. Uh, but uh, there are projects where you, you could probably collaborate and where, where, where yards could uh, join hands and uh, like he said, wherever there are difficulties uh, to uh, innovate and you don't have the proper environment, uh, there, there are ways to, con uh, uh, to collaborate. Uh, the, another way of collaboration that uh, we normally look at is uh, collaborating to bring in the best of technology into the country. So, uh, just to, uh, for a, to give you a context there, last week, uh, Cochin Shipyard Limited has signed an MOU with uh, IHC, which are, who are the leading uh, dredger manufacturing company in the world, design and manufacturing con company in the world. For the first time, uh, we are collaborating to bring in dredging, dredger, high capacity dredger construction into India, tying, uh, joining hands with IHC and uh, 
So collaborating to bring technology into the country and making into the country, making in the country, making in India, and then as a next step, making for the world. So this is a path which we can all follow. So collaboration definitely is, is something that we all should look at. And uh, th there is absolutely no question there. And Vice Admiral Chauhan, when we talk about collaboration, when we talk about technology, uh, the Indian workforce, Indian youngsters, uh, they, they could incorporate technology. But what kind of technology are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, uh, the software? Are we talking about heavy machinery uh, that would require a lot of investment, which perhaps uh, uh, many uh, private players would not be able to afford? Well, actually, this is a bit of a myth, uh, you know, that uh, private industry cannot generate the capital required. In any case, it is never going to be my contention that private industry should be head on uh, com competitors to public uh, industry. I, I think that I uh, personally, I have commanded the uh, Virat and I have great uh, insight into and great admiration for the work ethos of the Cochin Shipyard. So uh, I think right from there, if we just extrapolate those models, uh, Cochin Shipyard is a public sector undertaking. Cochin Shipyard is deeply involved with the private sector for everything from small craft and high technologies to large behemoths. After all, the uh, Indian aircraft, indigenous aircraft carrier is being built by them. So can these be built in all yards? Of course not. What kind of skill set should we, should we uh, uh, develop in our workforce? Is India's workforce not young people not capable? I think that this, I couldn't disagree more if anybody said that India's workforce is shy of the ability to develop high tech. Is India's private industry not capable of generating that? Is India's government not capable? All of the answers is yes, they are capable. Yes, they are capable then what we really require are policy changes and the difference between vision and rhetoric is after all what? It is the speed of implementation. For implementation speed to be accelerated, sometimes, very oft times, you need to share best practices, you need to import current and future technologies. The Indian maritime sector needs to become future ready, just like the Indian Navy expends a large amount of its effort making sure that it is future ready and not fighting or conceptualizing issues of security, whether hard security or holistic ones that are bedded in the past. So finally, your question is sharp. Does private industry have the capital that is tied up to another question, ma'am, and that is what is the cost of capital in India? And if the cost of servicing capital in India is, un, is artificially high, then there will be fiscal impediments in policy terms. So is the government, uh, is the government able to recognize that if we were to reduce taxation, if we were to provide fiscal incentives, then could we, could we utilize volume in order to offset losses of niche or specific uh, revenues? And the answer there lies, I think, in North Block. But the answer to the rest of us is quite clear that yes, it can happen. Today, India's shipbuilding industry, its workforce, its management cadres, its engineering cadres, is simply world class, but they're stuck in, 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 in a requirement to have a more free policy. And this Maritime India Vision 2030 and these policy initiatives and development of projects, the six major ones that are contained within this, are precisely the kind of tonic that the Indian maritime sector needs provided. It comes down with a taste of the honey that can only be provided by fiscal policy, which is aligned to this kind of thing. Otherwise, you will have two stovepipes, one preventing the other from growing. Uh, that's my view. Right. So uh, when we talk about uh, when we talk about the various uh, uh, various uh, forums 
that will be held to foster interaction between stakeholders uh, through B2B and G2B meetings. Then we also believe that there will be special sessions on investment opportunities in India's maritime sector. I believe that it's, uh, 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 what, about, uh, 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 what about not just a roadmap, what about a timeline, say, for example? Uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan, a timeline uh, when uh, you know when there will be so many more people involved in this uh, very restricted, very exclusive uh, 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 club of uh, you know very high tech uh, uh, um, people. Yeah, uh, talking about timelines and the maritime India vision, if that was uh, if I understood you very correctly, uh, I can say for sure that. Uh, all the initiatives that have almost, I think all the initiatives that have been uh, laid out or enlisted in the Maritime India Vision 2030 have uh, got timelines uh, attached to it. So this is not just a, a vision statement, it's got actionable points, it's got timelines associated with each of the actionable points. And I'm sure these are all going to get monitored uh, regularly. So what we're going to see uh, are, are, uh, is, a, is a document which will actually become reality. And as I mentioned a bit earlier, there could be a lot of uh, uh, initiatives which could actually uh, you know, uh, get completed before schedule because we are seeing a momentum that has developed and, and, uh, and a belief in the system that has developed, which we feel will help uh, in, in, in achieving most of the initiatives on time or before time. Right, right. We are looking at a sector which has been hit by a recession from which it has not really recovered. Uh, Vice Admiral Chauhan, we are also looking at a sector that has been hit very hard by a total deadlock during the pandemic because of the lockdown. Uh, uh, well, to recover from that, it would need a huge boost. Can the Maritime India Summit provide that boost? Yes, of course it can. First of all, uh, has the pandemic hit India and singled out India uh, to be hit? No, I, I think not. So there is certainly a slowdown of global trade. Maritime uh, mercantile merchandise trade has certainly been hit globally. Now, when everybody has been brought down, how fast can you recover? What is your resilience factor, which is something that I dwelt upon in an earlier response to you. And that factor of resilience is, I think, entirely in India's favor. Is the COVID imposed inabilities to actually meet face to face a debilitating uh, difficulty? In some ways, yes. And in other ways, it has taught us, no. After all, we have been projecting ourselves quite correctly, quite sincerely as a global leading IT power. What is, after all, what are smart ports, what are smart ships, and what are smart connectivities and smart trading? They rely upon software skills, upon human skills, or what used to be called skinware, and upon hardware in which area and of course upon connectivities in terms of digital in terms of digital connectivity so in none of these areas do i see india languishing where i see india needing philips to be able to accelerate utilizing its native innovative skills and its native resilience is in the ability to generate policy freedoms and these policy freedoms are not all stuck at the central government's level. They cascade down from central to state governments. If India decides that they want multiple transshipment ports to be located within 35 nautical miles of one another, then we will, we will suffer. And therefore, the ability to use these skills carefully, to use these skills to our advantage, is the function which will decide how right right so, will be able to right so as you said the opportunities are many in the maritime sector the uh, uh, india 
can be a leader in almost all aspects of uh, uh, in, in, the, in the very in the many opportunities that are presenting itself whether it is in education and training ship building or ship repair ship breaking and development of smart ports industrial cities opportunities exist in all sectors there are of course a number of obstacles and we hope that these will be sorted out further in the maritime india summit that is currently underway uh, from the 2nd to the 4th of March that the Prime Minister inaugurated a short while back. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Gopala Krishnan and also Vice Admiral Chauhan for sharing your thoughts with us on this edition of uh, Self-Reliant India. And viewers, many, many thanks for watching our show. We'll be back.